Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. Welcome to the Board of Trustees meeting for Pahala Valley Unified School District for October 26, 2022. We're glad you're here. If you have um, anything you'd like to address the board on, um, and it's on one of the agendized items, you need to put um, the number, the agendized item you'd like to speak to on a yellow card. They're in the back um, of the room, and you bring that card up to Ava. If you'd like to speak on anything else that isn't agendized tonight, there is a special um, section for that, and that is under visitor non-agendized items, and that's the number you'd put on there. If you feel like you need, if you need translation services tonight, we have a wonderful translator over here, Yorania Lopez, um, and Eva, can you say that in Spanish? Si ocupa servicios de traducción, la señora Lopez puede ayudarle con eso. Thank you. Um, so tonight we'll start our meeting out with the Pledge of Allegiance and we will ask Trustee Shocker to lead us tonight in the pledge. Thank you. Next up, we'll have um, Dr. Rodriguez will give her superintendent comments. Thanks, Dr. Rodriguez. Yeah, thank you so much. So as um, some know, I am part of a superintendent mm -hmm. think tank group. Um, so they, they pay my way to be able to go out um, and be part of the group. And so I thought that this would be something that would be interesting for um, everyone to be able to see. So. As you know, um, there is a major um, teaching shortage, um, not only um, statewide and nationally, but also internationally. And so, and so they actually had a group from Australia that came out and spoke to us about some of the work. And so that was really interesting with the global um, context that what they're predicting worldwide um, is that we are running out of teachers worldwide and that by 2023, um, we will likely have 69 million shortfall um, in, in teachers. And so some of the things that they are showing um, are very similar to things that we're seeing in the state of California and here in PVUSD. So they're seeing a higher turnover, increased workload, increased stress, um, decrease morale, um, toxic cultures, um, and um, reputational challenges. And so in the United States specifically, um, then that the same group kind of looked at the United States. And so similar to some of the things that we're seeing is we're seeing principals either leaving the profession as well or going um, back into the classroom. So you'll see the citations of where they received that information, but four out of 10 principals are expected to leave the profession in the next three years. One in three teachers are considering exiting the profession um, due, due to workload and COVID. And then um, K-12 employees are, um, are more likely than other government employees to be reporting um, feelings of stress, burnout, fatigue, and fear. Um, and so what they showed was for the first time um, in Australia's history, um, they actually, they do this sentiment um, survey um, throughout the entire, because it's a much smaller area, throughout the entire country. And what they found for the first time is that there was more people who had negative feelings than positive feelings um, in their educational um, system. And so for uh, United States, these are the top states that have the greatest shortages, and they're in the order of difficulty and you'll see who's number one on that um, and so that's California so we have the highest um, the greatest amount of shortages 
um, nationwide, there were this year 36,500 teacher vacancies in the nation. Um, and they estimate that 163,500 of those positions that were filled um, weren't fully cert um, certified or not certified in the subject that they're teaching. So um, very similar to um, some of the trends um, that we're seeing here. So you'll see how most of the teaching positions are being filled. Um, some of them we aren't doing, um, such as Teach America um, we're not doing, but we definitely are growing our own. Um, we had eight to 10 of our um, classified um, workers that actually became teachers this year. Um, so that was um, really incredible. You'll see some of the things that unfortunately we're having to do as well, which is buying prep time for teachers, which is down at the bottom and using long-term subs to teach for the year. So um, Maryland is a completely different state from us. Um, so, but I wanted to show this to you because it really shows the same trends in multiple states that you might not think would have the same issues. So when you look at voluntary resignations, um, they have 39% of their staff that's leaving is just saying, I don't wanna be in teaching anymore, I don't want to do it. 25% um, is for educational related employment and then they actually have a much higher retirement um, um, release than, than most school districts and then you'll see the other ones. And then very similar to us, where those vacancies are is similar to what we have. So for elementary, um, we actually don't have any vacancies at the elementary level, um, but when you look at Maryland, it, they do have vacancies, high vacancies in the two areas that we also have them, which is single subject, middle and high schools, and special education. So the whole group is continuing to work on so what do we do about this, right? How do we continue to strengthen that pipeline? And so there's six different strategies um, that we're focusing on. And in upcoming um, superintendent comments, I will um, continue to hash out some of those um, pipeline alternatives. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, next, we have governing board members um, report on standing committees. And we'll start with Jennifer Holm. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I attended our uh, Pajaro Valley Education Foundation meeting, and I, I'm sure uh, our, the, the President uh, Orozco will, will talk about a little bit more about what we're working on, so I'll just mention that I attended that meeting. But we're excited about some of our upcoming events. Um, but I also attended our, our first planning session for our um, seal of uh, civic engagement for you know, encouraging our students to be in, engaged in the you know, civic process and kind of what that would look like, what, you know, how we would develop you know, projects for our students. And it's just, it, um, it's exciting to be you know, participating and hearing the student voice and you know, be involved in that process. And I, I appreciated the opportunity to be in the room as that was being discussed and developed. And so I encourage students who are interested in, in that process to participate. Trustee Soto. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'll yield my comments this evening so we can move forward with the meeting. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you. Trustee Orozco. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, so it's been a couple of busy weeks for me as a trustee being out in the community. Um, I attend the PBUSD Passport um, event at Gilroad Gardens, and this is the opportunity through extended learning. Thank you, Jen Bruno and her team for putting this together, where families actually get access to Gilroy Gardens. They get their dinners paid for. They get their tickets paid for. Um, it's my understanding that about 800 of our families participated district-wide in this event, um, and it's free. So it was really exciting to see some of our students and families really take advantage of these opportunities, including my own. So my kids definitely enjoyed um, spending an evening at Gilroy Gardens as a family. So thank you again, the Extended Learning Department, for putting this on. I also uh, been doing some volunteering at Watsonville Charter School of the Arts. I chaperone a couple of their field trips, including the one at Monterey uh, Bay Aquarium, and today at uh, the Crystal Bay Farms for their kinder class. 
Um, I also attended the Paro Valley Education Foundation meeting. Um, and we have our um, superhero 5K, 1K race coming up December 10th. Um, it's $40 for a family of five. Uh, $20 for individual with t-shirts, uh, $5 for kids, capes and um, masks will be included, um, and $100 for sports team. Um, so there's going to be food truck vendors and activities for kids, so I really encourage our community to take advantage of this event. Uh, we do have our Facebook um, event up and running, and you can register online. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Trustee Shocker. Well, Trustee Roscoe stole some of what I was going to say. <laughs> but um, thank you, community, for being here tonight. Um, I want to say um, thank you to the students who participated in the Student Leader for a Day, City Leader for a Day program. Um, some of that's still ongoing, so not all students have had their day yet, but it was wonderful to see an expansion of that program with Dr. Rodriguez for supervisor of a day, um, having our students participate with city council and um, county supervisors, supervisor offices. Um, as Dr. Rodriguez touched on, there is a mass exodus, it seems like, in our education field. Um, education field's not only feeling it, our healthcare workers are also feeling it. So it's a, a lot of stress that people have been under, especially after the pandemic. And I think it's important that we all show empathy and compassion to all of those who are trying their best to get their jobs done on a daily basis and those that are showing up and doing their best for the kids here in Parho Valley um, Unified School District. Um, we do need to work on a few things, and hopefully um, those things are in motion. And there are things that we can do as a community and just support our teachers, support our bus drivers and really realize that they're doing the best that they can, um, getting our kids to school safely, having our kids in, in classrooms, teaching our kids. We've been able to reduce our vacancies in PVUSD um, for teachers, and so we are really making a strive to make improvements and to make sure that the kids are all happy and healthy and thriving through providing different programs for them. Um, we are looking at different things we can do to increase salary. We've talked about it in the past in public sessions and boardroom, things like moving the 3% reserve. We've talked about looking at workforce housing for our teachers and our workers. We've also talked about looking at a uh, subsidized daycare program um, by working in partnerships with our county and city. So we are looking for alternatives and we are doing studies and we are trying to move these projects forward. So thank you for your patience. Thank you, Trustee Shocker. Um, since our last board meeting, I attended a PBPSA meeting, which is our Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance. That's a standalone mental health agency that's dedicated to our district, to the children and families. And I sit on the board there and we're making great progress. We have a brand new executive director. Um, who's doing great. So um, that was an interesting meeting. I was also interviewed by the California School Boards Association on any facility improvements that have come in the wake of um, money that we got as one-time money from the state after the pandemic. Um, I also attended um, an event with our Congressman Jimmy Panetta where I talked to him at length about improving um, the situation for our district and for districts across California to improve school funding. Um, and that's about it. Um, tonight, Trustee Georgia Acosta is absent, and she let our superintendent know that she was not feeling well, and Trustee Dodge Jr. had a death in his family, and so at this board, and I'm sure everyone in the room sends him our deepest condolences on their family's loss. Um, on a happier note, um, we have some donations to acknowledge on behalf of the Emerald Lagasse Kitchen and Culinary Garden. And so with great gratitude, I would like to thank James Baker, S. Baker, for a $250 donation. Um, uh, thank you to Don Burgett for $500 donation, to Kathy and Dan Cavanaugh for $100, Sarah Hulick for $50, Alicia Jimenez for $50. Thank you, Alicia. Christina Coda for $25. 
Amanda Ingledrum Magana for 25, Bridget Maloney for 100, Deanne Nahara for 25, Chris Newstetter $30, Rob and Christine Allen $1,500, Kathy Semmingson $500, Marilyn and Ken Cole $2,500, and the Zamora family $500. So the total of all of these donations is $6,155. That's amazing. So thank you to all the donors who care about the kids in this district. Um, next up, we will have a very special item. It's the introduction of our 2022-2023 student trustee and administration of the symbolic oath. And uh, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez will talk about the process and introduce our student trustee. And I'll be administering the oath momentarily. Yeah, thank you so much. So it's always such a privilege to be able to interview so many wonderful students that want to take this position. This year, we actually had an even harder um, job than normal because we had so many wonderful children, so many wonderful high schoolers that really wanted it. Um, so it would have been um, fantastic if we could have had many more. Um, but Muriel really... Um, really stood out to us because of just um, her compassion for others, her desire to really serve um, not only this community, but just the whole community of Pajaro Valley, um, her desire to ensure that the l least represented voices are present. Um, and so um, we did the unanimous vote of um, really deciding that Muriel was going to be um, our student trustee for the year, and I know she's going to do a fantastic job. Um, all the other students that didn't um, get the position, um, we know are still going to be here present, um, being able to be our student um, representatives for the sites, and so we'll still be able to hear their voices as well. Um, so we will invite um, Muriel up to um, do her oath um, with President De Serpa. And uh, uh, yeah, and I'm going to invite my fellow board to follow me to the podium because um, although we represent all kids in this district, um, some of our representatives up here tonight actually have Watsonville, right? Your PV or Watsonville? Watsonville. What, that's what I thought. I got scared for saying Watsonville High in their area. So if my fellow board can follow me to the podium, we'll administer the oath. Hey, she, she can come up for she can come forward. This one, I don't know how far that one goes. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Congratulations on having such an awesome daughter. She's unbelievable, right? Yeah. We want, we want you here. Okay. So this is Moriel Mamaril. Did I say that right? Uh, put your hand up. Right hand. I, Kimberly DeSerpa, President of the Board of Trustees of PVUSD, do hereby certify that Ms. Mamaril was officially appointed as a student trustee at the October 26, 2022 board meeting of the Board of Trustees for the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. And then you read this. I, Moriel Mamarill, do solemnly swear that I will defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. I think we'll have a picture now. Alicia, are you going to? All right, let's. Can we... 
we get over here? So when I first saw this young woman speak, I was blown away. She's so brilliant and has so much humility. And we're excited for the places you're going to go. So thank you for joining us on the board as a trustee, student trustee. So you have a few remarks. Of course. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. And thank you so much for the kind words. I'm so grateful to be here. And I actually was thinking of just saying something on the spot, but I think I really wanted to express something specific. And so I wrote this. Being the student trustee means a lot. And it's already pretty nerve wracking just being up here at the podium. So I only imagined what it'd feel like to be part of the board. And yet, here I am. I really wanted to give a special thank you to Ms. Grants, the legendary activities director of Watsonville High, <laughs> Celeste Gutierrez, as well as Dr. Sabah over at the Santa Cruz County Office of Education, who I'm lucky to consider some of my in most influential mentors. As well, thank you to everyone here at the district who has shown me so much compassion, empathy, and a lively and welcoming spirit. I saw this as another opportunity to build onto the reality that students can use their voices to make change in our community. I'm thankful to know that this position is not the start, but a continuation of why it's so important to highlight the very people we strive to serve and represent. Every day, I'm so inspired by the passionate students across our district who have the passion to want better and obtain better for their peers, as well as the willingness they show in contributing to a fulfilling educational experience that every student truly deserves. This makes me all the more excited to be part of the school board. Thank you. And Moriel, I've had the privilege of having um, student trustees sit next to me for many board meetings over the years. And I try to mentor them a little bit, so I'm going to ask Jen Holm to do the same. So there's no, um, there's no dumb question. If you have no idea what we're talking about, you can write Jen a little note and ask her, and she can help explain things to you, okay, or text or whatever you want to do. But um, I don't want you to ever be afraid or ashamed of asking questions, and you don't have to ask out loud. You can, of course, but um, feel free to call on your neighbor there, and she'll help you understand what's going on, okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay, next up we have our approval of the agenda. I move to approve. Second. First and second. All those Actually, in favor? Give me one um, second. Okay. And we have a high school. Yeah, oh, high school student representative. Sorry, I got excited. <laughs> Is Aptos High here tonight for a high school student board representative report? It's a video. It's a video? Okay. <laughs> I'm Diana Luis. Hi, I'm Emmeline, and we are the student board reps from Aptos High School. So here's a little bit about our school so far. Yeah, uh, starting with academics, our first quarter just ended. Um, all of our teachers were able to turn in uh, quarter grades, and we also just started extended learning. It's available from Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday after school for anybody, any students that need tutoring. Um, our casting for our upcoming play, Head Over Heels, is done and we are very excited and the play will take place in February. Yeah, um, next is activities. Um, this week is homecoming week for us, so we have a full week of spirit days. We have a parade on Wednesday um, where all of the classes get to show off their floats. 
We also have a football game this Friday against Alisal, um, where we'll be introducing our home our homecoming royalty. And we have a dance on Saturday to top everything off. It's a Monster Mash costume dance. And lastly, for athletics, our football has been going really strong this year. We've won a majority of our games. And like Donna said, we have a home game against Alisal this Friday, which is also our homecoming game, which we're really excited for. For water polo, our girls water polo team has been also doing very well this year and their league semis and finals are coming up this weekend. Um, for volleyball, our girls volleyball has their SCCAL league finals this week. Um, and for tennis, our girls tennis team has done amazing with them winning four out of five of their matches so far. Our dance and cheer teams have been working hard to prepare halftime routines for football and our dance is preparing for competitions as well. And as for upcoming, wrestling is starting next week with their first practice being on the 31st. So yeah. Yeah, that's an update that's cool. on, as to what's happening around Aptos High School. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now moving on to approval of our agenda. I think you want to move again. I'm sure. I move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 502. Thank you. Okay, so if we're on. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm confused. 5.1 approval of our October 12th, 2022 board meeting minutes. Move to approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries 502. And next up is our public hearing on CSEA's appointed personnel commissioner. Good evening, uh, President DeSerpa, board members, and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Pam Shanks, Director of Classified Personnel for the district. Uh, the Personnel Commission has three seats, and one of those seats is appointed by CSEA. Um, as previously announced, um, Rebecca Valdivia Casey is resigning from her position effective December 1st this year. Um, CSEA has submitted the name of the person they recommend appointing to um, this public hearing, which gives the public, employees, and administration the opportunity to express their views on the qualifications of the person recommended. Um, CSEA has recommended Catherine Griffin as their appointee to the Personnel Commission, and she would start in December. Um, a little bit about Ms. Griffin. Um, she grew up in Santa Cruz County and was part of the first class to go all the way through Harbor High School. Um, she graduated with honors and was the recipient of the Bank of America Foreign Language Award. Her language skills have been invaluable to many aspects of her life and career. Ms. Griffith also has uh, three bilingual children who were educated in the Pajaro Valley Unified School District and went on to further their education in the University of California system. Her first exposure to PVUSD began in her children's classrooms, first as a volunteer, then as an instructional assistant. Um, she continued her career with PVUSD working as a campus supervisor at Watsonville High School, followed by the payroll department, then in categorical programs, and then she finished her career for the last 18 years in the finance department as a staff accountant. She was able to build on her acquired skills to work in the most rewarding of careers, serving her community in the school district. Uh, during her career, she had the honor of serving on the CSEA negotiating team as a CSEA member on the PVUSD Benefits Committee and on the Professional Growth Committee uh, for classified employees representing colleagues working for the district raising their families as she had. She values an important strength of the district, which is that many employees are also parents of district students. Ms. Griffith is now retired and looks forward to serving her community on the PVUSD Personnel Commission. Her experience in this diverse community will be an asset to our merit system. I look forward to working with Ms. Griffin in the upcoming term she has agreed to serve. Um, this is the public hearing. Um, under action items later in the agenda, the board will be asked by CSEA to approve Ms. Griffin as their appointee to the Personnel Commission. Thank you. Are there any speakers? Uh, we have no speakers to this item. Okay. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? No? Okay. Thank you. Public hearing closed. Thank you.
Next up, we have item 7.1, our visitor non-agenda items. This is a time for public comment on things that are not on the agenda. Do we have any speakers tonight? We do. We have eight speakers under this item. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is call three at a time. So if you can please line up behind the podium. Um, actually, there's nine. So if you can. Um... Oh, OK. Thank you, Juan. It's for 7.1. OK. We have 10. 10 speakers under this item. So. <laughs> As I was saying, um, I, I'm going to be calling through at a time, so please just make sure you line up behind the podium so we uh, are able to uh, uh, hear what you have to say. So we have Lowell Hurst, followed by Chris Webb and Brand Brandon Denise. Uh, good evening, board members and uh, staff. My name is Lowell Hurst, and I do reside in uh, Maria Roscoe's district. You might recognize me as uh, I was an employee of yours for 32 years. Now, that's a, that's a long time. The reason I'm here this evening is uh, to bring awareness to a measure on the tail end of your ballot. It's called Measure R. Measure R is for resiliency, uh, roads, reading, recreation, and of course, more resiliency. You know, there's a lot of things that we'd like to do in this community about improving conditions for all our residents and our students and everybody else. Well, this will help. And it is what they say, and it's a nasty word, it's a sales tax increase. But the sweet part of that is it's only one half of one cent one half of one cent. Now, I was going to cut some pennies in two and give them out, but I was advised that might not be a good idea. This will, you know, that's 50 cents on a $100 purchase. And so a half a cent, they do add up. We know that. But look what we may be able to accomplish. Uh, invest in, a, in quality uh, roads, streets, improvements, pedestrian and bike safety. Repair aging parks, playgrounds, fields, maintain trails, create safe places for kids to play and learn and expand after school and youth development programs and increase services to the library programs and the bibliovan to neighborhoods and, se and senior communities. And so I'm just here to bring awareness to that. We appreciate the opportunity to talk about Measure R. And if there's anyone in the audience who'd like to have one of these, I have one for you, too. Thank you. Thank you, Lowell. So uh, at the risk of jinxing myself, I wanted to thank HR for finding Renaissance a great principal uh, and during the middle of the school year. So I, I appreciate that, that our, our new person, they seem to get Alt-Ed, they prioritize what worked for students, uh, they respect, appreciate, and understand the contributions and the limits of teachers, um, and then also the contributions of unions. So, so I'm, I'm very hopeful, more so than I have been in a while. And reflecting on the past, um, one lesson I take from the last couple uh, authority figures we had in that role, um, I noticed that it seems to me that schools do better when we like recognize what works for the school and, and less so when we push things down on them from, from the top. And then uh, like kind of with that, I'm, I want to keep this principle. So I'm hoping that we don't provide undue pressure from the district office for them to maybe serve some agenda that maybe doesn't always work in the alt ed setting so i i, I want to i don't know if there's any west wing fans out there but let renaissance be renaissance and and let's keep our our leader in that way the other thing i wanted to um say was with the election fast approaching um i wanted to wish uh trustee shocker the best of luck um i you know having seen a lot of the proceedings here i felt like I, you i have the most faith in you to always do the right thing 
and I, I wish you the best. I'm, I appreciate that you went to the forum. I also want it, uh, Trustee DeSerpa to know that I, I did vote for you in the PVFT for us to endorse you, and I think you have served with honor and dignity, and, and I appreciate that, and I wish you the best of luck. I appreciate that you also went to the forum, and I think anyone who didn't go to the forum is not really fit to preside over teachers. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you to the board for allowing me to speak tonight. I'm Brandon Denise, resource teacher over at Lakeview Middle School. And I wanted to share how the staffing crisis in this district um, is failing the students at Lakeview. Um, Lakeview currently doesn't have an 8th grade science teacher or a 7th grade language arts and social studies teacher. Um, how will the rest of these students' education develop? Missing out on these core classes. Um, each week when we do our social emotional reflections in the Sown to Grow platform, I have students who share that they wish they had a full-time teacher for these classes. These students are being seriously impacted by the failure to fill these vacancies. Um, today we only had one teacher out. But due to these two vacancies, it took 15 different staff members to cover for these classes. 11 teachers losing their prep. How can teachers plan and implement high quality instruction when we're constantly subbing during our prep? Um, we have days where our counselors are subbing as well. And how can our students meet their academic, social, and emotional needs when the counselors aren't there because they're subbing in a classroom? We even have days where both of our administrators are subbing every single period of the day. How can a school site function when the administrators are covering classes? Um, student safety is also at risk during this. Um, yesterday we had six staff members out, so I'm really thankful that that earthquake was really minor, but there were moments of true fear during those moments where the ground was shaking. Um, I know Dr. R will be at our site tomorrow, and I appreciate when you do come because it it's commendable that you're there seeing what's going on in our sites. Um, so I would ask that you spend a good amount of time in those classrooms that don't have teachers and just see how those students are being impacted because they are feeling the impact of not having teachers in those classrooms. So thank you, and um, I'll be back up here later. Sorry, it takes a while. Um, so next we have uh, Han, um, Sean Henry followed by Johnny, I believe is Martinez, and Melissa Mathis. Hello, uh, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. Uh, again, my name is Sean Henry. I'm a school psychologist here. And the first thing I wanted to actually do is um, acknowledge one of, the, one of the donations. I don't know if it happened before, but it was actually for our staff at Watsonville High School. It was a little surprise. So if you could hold that little bag up. Everybody got a thank you, and, and uh, you are awesome. Thank you for, the, for making a difference. And so we think you rock. Appreciate you all, Twin Lakes Church. So I don't know if other, if other schools get that, but um, I know each one of our staff members are very appreciative of that. Um, originate. I actually was going to talk about um, recommending having exit interviews for people that are re retiring. And so we had a colleague, um, Doris Takayama, who um, was uh, you know, a person uh, hard to fill those shoes, uh, figuratively at least. And, uh, and this year we're going to have Ralph Howe, uh, who figuratively and literally his shoes will be hard to fill. And so uh, Doris actually had asked for an exit interview. And I guess it was not a common practice. In a lot of organizations, you do that. So I recommend at least starting with your um, staff that retire. Um, Ralph is a unique guy that basically probably could have retired a few years ago, but I know he mentioned to me um, that he wanted to be back and, and get the schools up and running after COVID. Uh, so those are the type of people that when we lose them, you know, we lose them, but we should take some of their wisdom. Um, hearing that it's a global challenge uh, in, by two 2030 for teachers and educators. I always remember learning. Um, it's always harder to hire people than it is to retain them. And so I think there are some things that can be done um, in an emergency like this. One of the things would be, I think all the teachers would, with limited time would appreciate um, not having every single minute managed on Wednesday 
giving up some of that time right now would actually make a difference in helping to retain and showing some respect that actually they kind of know where their time would better be spent sometimes than people in the district office. Respectfully, thank you. Good evening, my board members. I am Johnny Martinez, and Johnny, I pull the here. mic by your mouth so we can hear you. Sorry. Thank you. No, no problem. Oh yeah, you're tall. <laughs> so I am here to represent uh, transportation. So we've already talked about this two weeks ago. Our transportation department is really, really hurting. Uh, most of our drivers are working double. Dispatchers, mechanics are working double and not, we haven't seen anything yet. So my drivers are working double, not only that, getting yelled at by some uh, teachers or teacher's aide, why are you guys so late? Well, we're late because there's no driver for this route and we volunteered to come and help and get the students, yet, yet we get yelled at. So that's one. We go home, drop off the student to the parent and we get yelled at by the parent. So damn if we do, damn if we don't. And on that note, uh, we've talked about last week how my drivers are really, really tired. We're doing double. We're working 12-hour shifts, 15-hour shifts, and we're only getting paid eight hours, seven hours. Why? Because California code forbids us. There's a code, hours of service, 12, 16. We can't work past 16 hours. Yet in our split shift, those four hours, three hours are counted against us. So we do get tired. But we when call in sick, we get nasty emails. So under vehicle code 13, California Code and Regulations 1214, no driver shall operate a motor vehicle when fatigued. So that's state law, and it's not contract. And I don't know when contract is higher than state law. So even when we take another day off on Monday, we get a nasty email saying, you must report to work the next day. Under that law, no motor carrier shall require or permit a driver to operate a motor vehicle while the driver's ability to learn is impaired so likely uh, through fatigue and illness. So we really do not appreciate that. I know my time's up, but we really do not appreciate that when we're trying to take care of ourselves and take care of our students. Thank you, Johnny. One mistake, and that's, that's fatal for us, especially for our students. So next we have um, Jorge Moreno, Donna Lefevre, and Juan Rocha. Um, I'm Melissa. I'm a driver out at Transportation. I was going to read from this, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Actually. I'm going to speak from my heart. I have a six-year-old daughter. I have a family. I have a mortgage. I have a car payment. I've been a driver out at transportation for 18 years. When I started there, I made really good money. It, it has not progressed with, with the society and everything else with inflation. Um, I get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I drag my little 6-year-old child to work with me. I start at 5.30, and I end at 5.15 in the, afternoon, in the evening. My daughter is with me all day when she's not in school. I used to do an after school. Last year, I'd get home at 8 o'clock at night for doing my after school so I can make my car payment, which I can no longer do because of the late start this year with Aptos High and all the, all the high schools and all the junior high. So now my husband has to make my car payment. I have no spending money. And real quick on what Johnny said, we should be getting a split dif dif differential pay. I mean, we're at work 10. 12, 13 hours a day. I am exhausted, exhausted. I can't even tell you. I can't, I can't even be a good parent. I can't even sit down and do homework with my child. It, it's a problem and it needs to be addressed. And also real quickly, um, we're supposed to have a reclassification every two years. We haven't had one since 2016. Why is that? I think you guys need to look into that. We deserve more. We work 
hard and our job is demanding. I can't even tell you how demanding it is. I, I thought I was getting into a good career. I thought I would be able to spend more time with my family and my kids, and I am not. I do not. And that now this year with the new uh, late start, it's worse. It's so awful. Anyways, thank you. I did call up Jorge Moreno. Is he here? Okay. <laughs> Donna Lefever and Juan Rocha. Hi. Um, my name is Donna Lefever. I'm a teacher at Watsonville High School. Um, I just want to say that I stand in solidarity with our bus drivers. Um, the work that they do. My, my sister teaches special ed um, in the district as well. And so she talks to me about how much she supports our bus drivers because of how much they have to do for the kids that they're transporting. Um, the kids that I teach are high school. I have freshmen and juniors. They were really affected by um, Friday and Monday not having um, a way to get to school. A lot of their peers were not there. They were worried. And they were asking a lot of questions. And they were wondering why the district doesn't pay these positions more, because they know how important and how hard these people work. And the kids are asking me. And I, I don't know what to tell them. I say, you know what? We're working on it. The drivers are showing up and trying to speak for themselves. And that's a great way that they're modeling how to advocate for things that they need to, for, to value the work that they're doing. We need to value them. We need to pay them more. And we talk about all this one-time monies. We can't pay higher salaries because we have one-time monies only. Well, let's make one-time stipends right now so we can help support them right now. Let's do that right now. <clears throat> we need to be valuing these jobs because we are going to lose people. Even you're saying 12% increase on their salary. I mean, if their salary is $17, they're not, still not making $20 an hour. Like, what? This, this is math. Like, we got to look at what we're talking about and looking how we're presenting this to our community. I mean, these people are parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles of kids in our community. Like, this is our community. Let's help them. Good evening. Members, uh, my name is Juan Rocha from Transportation also as well. I just get a few remarks. I know today we had a meeting earlier with uh, Dr. Rodriguez and we some other members, uh, Clint. And uh, you hear a lot of our concerns. And I just want to uh, make sure that the board knows and hold, start holding um, certain positions accountable for it. There's no reason why we are in this position right now where there's so many shortages at all. This should have been taken care of many years past. And I think it's time for you guys to, to start holding certain positions account accountable for it. And it shouldn't happen. I could tell you that Ben um, was saying one of the reasons is because insurance go higher, 2% plus every year. Well, insurance go higher, salary stays the same. Doesn't make any sense, at least to me. So I think it's time for you guys to start acting, to start holding people accountable, and to start looking at the district of the necessities, as the children, drivers, and families, and everything you know. So that's pretty much it for me. Thank you. And the last speaker to this item, Marilyn Garrett. You could remedy the bus situation immediately. Why don't you do it? I, too, want things to be better for students and staff. Welcome as a student representative. 
The reason I have tremors, according to my health care provider, is because I worked in this district by fields and pesticides and pests right over here at MSD school. And pesticides have caused essential tremors. And I read microwave radiation does the same. To make it better for students and everyone, these sources of radiation should be removed. The Wi-Fi, the cell towers, etc. And here's a card I'm going to leave with you because as a student, you study things. The district has been provided this information repeatedly and disregard the facts. But every time wireless devices emit microwave radiation, a known biological hazard. Every time you use a wireless device, you are exposed to microwave radiation. The World Health Organization labels this radiation as a class 2B possible carcinogen in the same category as lead, DDT, and chloroform. Cell and cordless phones and other wireless devices, cell towers and antennas, smart meters, microwave ovens, and Wi-Fi routers all create this electrosmog. Because it's popular doesn't mean it's safe. I don't vote for anyone who microwaves children. I will leave the board with this trifold fact, the greatest lie ever told, that vaccines are safe and effective, uh, put out by Weston A. Price for Thank wise you, traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. When my daughter graduated from Aptos I, Marilyn. We had a Thank choice. You, Thank you very much. Sorry, oh, it was under the incorrect items. I had you under 8.2. Uh, would it be okay for it's me okay. to? It's okay. You want to come to the podium? Yeah. It's Valentino okay. Perez, right? Valentino Perez. Okay. First of all, good evening. Hello. Um, Juventino Perez. I used to work for the transportation department for 15 plus years. Um, that is my lovely wife over there. I'm the one that pays now the car payment. I left transportation about a year ago uh, to a job now that I make four times what you guys provide. Um, I couldn't afford my mortgage. I couldn't put food on my table for my daughters, two beautiful young daughters. Um, I had to leave. Couldn't afford it. Uh, we're all here trying to live the dream. We're all trying to uh, just live free, have money saved up for something. I didn't even have money for an emergency. Couldn't afford anything. If I had a flat tire, I couldn't afford it. If all of a sudden someone invited me somewhere, I couldn't go. Didn't have the money for it. Um, so like I said, I'm one of many that are willing to take off because $21 an hour is nothing. And I'm sorry, but your 12.5% raise, keep it. Why do we want that? Why would we stay for that? Three bucks? I mean, what, what can we do here? And the Santa Cruz County is the biggest district here, and you guys don't even care about us. I mean, that's what I feel. I'm sorry, that's just my own opinion, but if you guys cared about us, you guys would put effort into figuring something out, how to get us paid a little bit more. We're up 12 hours a day driving a school bus. People don't even want to take a road trip with their own kids because they only have maybe two or three. We have 60 students on the bus. Our responsibility is crazy. We eat, sleep, drive a bus. Every day, every weekend. We can't have fun because that's our life, our livelihood. We lose our license, we're done. You guys lost the driver. We lost our life, we're done. We can't do anything. And we do that with passion. We love what we do. We always do it. We show up when we have to, when we can't. When we're sick, we show up, regardless of what happens. We get yelled at, like as everyone said, by teachers, by parents, by our own district, because we're not doing the right thing. And yet we're helping you guys out, move our kids, and that's who's important, our kids. But we're not important to you guys. Thank you. So before, is it Monse? Okay.
Come on up. Is there anyone else who put it under know, the right? wrong? Oh, no. I know. <laughs> That's okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening, board members. Um, my name is Monte. I come to you today as a daughter to talk to you about my mom. Right there in the pink. Uh, she's one of your employees. She's a bus driver. And to you, she's probably just another worker who's supposed to work and is here at the meeting. But to me, she's my mom. And something my mom knows a tremendous amount is how to love. Um, my mom has always advised me and my sisters to find a job that you love so that you don't have to work every day. It doesn't have to feel like it. And that's what she does. She models it by waking up every morning at 4 in the morning and coming home at 8 p.m. She follows her own advice. It shows in her daily interactions with families and students. And it's even incredible that after even 10 years, students come up to her and say, you were my bus driver. She's like, yeah, I know. And she remembers all of their names, all of their names. And that's incredible. However, all those beautiful things like love don't pay the bills. They don't pay to, for, to send three daughters to universities. They don't pay to feel better mentally and physically. And it's really disheartening as a social welfare graduate student to hear all of the scapegoating that has come, that has trickled down and has been pushed out to the community by press releases, the language that is used, that is being, that is pointing the finger at people like my mom who support and nurture and build relationships with students and families every single day. So I ask you, the board, a big question for a big concern. As Dr. Rodriguez pointed out, with teachers is happening with all employees. What are best practices for your employees? Because it's clearly not just a driver's problem, it's everyone's problem. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have employee organization comments, and we'll start with PBFT, item 8.1, the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Good evening. Um, I'm Nelly Baquera Boggs. I'm the president for the PBFT. Um, it is wonderful to see all the people in the audience tonight. Um, and our CSEA brothers and sisters, we want to let you know that we stand behind you and support you. We understand, um, we have members who understand the hardship of working a split shift, the unjustness in it, especially when you are not paid very well. We have preschool teachers. You have heard me board speak about our preschool teachers who work a split shift when a gallon of gas costs $7 and you have preschool teachers who are making not even $16 an hour, have to work from 6 to 10 and then come back and work from 4 to 6 or 2 to 6, um, but not even give them prep time so they have to work extra for free to make sure that the centers are ready for their families that they serve. So yeah, Dr. Rodriguez shared some really great data. Um, that's wonderful. You get to fly out and be part of this conversation, but the solutions that were up there were just more to our workload. They weren't anything taking off our workload. So that, I hope, is something that you all noticed. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to give some examples of some of the things, because I know I only have like so many minutes. Um, we only are allowed to speak for so many minutes. Um, and I'll start. I have a fractured wrist and a broken thumb, so I can barely read the writing that I, <laughs> that I have in front of me, so I'm going to try my best to remember. But workload. This year, the district has put so much on our teachers. We, we all thought coming into this year, okay, we've had our one year coming back. You've already heard me talk about workload this year to you in these meetings. Um, and it is worse because it keeps getting put onto the plates of the educators and nothing is taken off. Their time is super micromanaged. As a matter of fact, I was looking at my board comments from last year this time and I could actually just read that. 
and you and it would be the exact same thing me talking about how this management micromanages the teacher's time and takes the teacher's time and then will be happy to discipline them if they're not prepared i'm hearing that from our bus drivers as well um so and you've heard us say that our work environment is our students learning environment we don't exist in silos they don't learn in a silo we need to be prepared we need that time so that we can be prepared when our time is micromanaged and any time within our contract contract day is considered owned by this district you are taking that time away from the student you are not allowing the professionals to be professionals so what ends up happening is a lot of bad feelings between people in which I've been spending a lot of time stepping in to uh, mediate and or um, talk down I know to you know like talk on our, our our member down from really losing it and it's just heartbreaking because we're educators because we chose to do this we chose to go through a, this the many years it takes to not only become a trained educator but for people that don't know when we get our credential we have two years of probationary teaching that means that in order to get a cleared credential we have to teach for two years before it's fully cleared and we can go we aren't under the scrutiny of a bunch of other evening classes that we would have to take after we finished our credential program and are in our first two years of being an educator so there is a lot that goes into it there's a lot of PD that goes into it there's a lot of testing that we pay for to stay on track and being educators yet we cannot be trusted to be professionals um, we have members who are being discriminated against still in certain departments you've heard me speak about this for the past couple of years our teachers in the early childhood programs especially our teachers that work in the seasonal programs as these are women I'm gonna say they're women because they were they're all women that I that I know that are teaching in the our seasonal program and they work with families who work in agriculture they are Spanish speakers mainly who learned to persevered and learned English who persevered and went and took the college classes to become a permitted preschool teacher and their directors of this program still discriminate against them one teacher was um, Thank you, forced Nellie. to send a very very disparaging letter about herself which was an accusatory letter and the parents are upset rightfully so so the practices that are happening to confront yeah to confront the um, stress that we're all feeling are, are not fitting of a district who is communicating todos nos levan, you know, nos elevamos. That it's a whole child, whole family, whole community. You're leaving your employees behind. When you do that, you leave your students behind. Thanks, Nellie. Thank you. Thank you. It's item 8.2, CSEA, our California School Employees Association. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So guys, um, before you begin, I am, I am timing you on my phone. That's all right. I've been um, timed many times. No, I'm just um, letting you know. I know. I can't switch that yeah. two to five. Yeah, 30 seconds is a long time. Trust me, even five seconds. Um, I'm here on behalf of the CSEA. I'm the vice president. Um, been a district employee for 20 years, 22 years now. I'm going to start by saying what our president always says. Um, we're here for the children. And for the district it's an, it's important for everyone to understand that classified employees have not received an increase in pay there is a tenant agreement that is that we agreed upon and the district and the union union leaders but it has not been brought to the members 
<clears throat> for approval because we are still in negotiations for the last year, 20, 21, 22, 22, and 23. Also, the last increase received was in 2020, 26, and 17. We are currently working for wages that are five years old. All of the media, all the media and notice going out are misleading. The district is advertising a 12.5% increase to pay for social, for social media, but it is not approved yet. And we did not, we do not, we do not know when we will receive it because we're still working on negotiation. Um, other than that, just want to say thank you and letting you know that our classified employees are working hard to keep our schools running and our kitchen staff, our office staff, our bus drivers, our maintenance department, everybody. And that's all I have. And I think the only best thing about this all thing is that wrestling season starts November the 1st. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have item 8.3, our Pajaro Valley Association of Managers, or PAVAM. PAVAM. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, I'm Dan Weiser. I'm the Director of Technology Services, and I'm presenting on behalf of PAVAM tonight. Um, and tonight, I want to highlight the amazing work of our technology innovation coaches. Um, just, it's only been a few months in the school year, and they've just done such an amazing amount of work and support for our classroom teachers for students. And I'm going to go over a few of the things that they've been um, implementing and working on. Um, as always, they support our liaison program, which is a teacher from every school in the district. Um, they've been planning winter institutes um, and supporting teachers uh, during, and during the day and then after school in a variety of trainings. Um, they support our parent education programs, uh, the parent engagement network, they offer classes for parents to support their children uh, in the appropriate use of technology and how to access the various technology-based systems to support student success in the district. Um, they've been working on our new websites for the, the Catapult system, the new uh, content management system that we're working toward implementing. Um, and through October, October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and last week was Digital Citizenship Week. Uh, and, the, and the coaches put together an amazing uh, group of lessons, activities, videos, and other digital resources, all broken out by grade level, that they shared with all the teachers and the, and, uh, and the liaisons, and, and, and the teachers were using with their students. Um, they answered dozens of calls every day on the Technology Instructional Support Hotline, providing one-on-one -on -one support for teachers on all the dozens of technology systems, digital curriculum resources, and all the other uh, technology-based uh, content that they're using in the classroom. They've been supporting all teachers as they set up uh, for each year and, and configure their um, Synergy gradebook, and have been working especially hard helping to set up and support the elementary teachers that are in the pilot schools, starting to use the elementary Synergy gradebook. Um, and they've been supporting all of our new teachers and new administrators and new classified staff um, doing orientation sessions and then supporting them individually with, with content specific to their positions. Uh, and then we, we have a huge amount of of resources that are on a website that originally was called our distance learning resources website and now it's you know we transitioned it a while back to digital learning resources uh, and they continue to create screencasts and put together how-to docs and all kinds of supporting uh, documentation for staff students and parents um, they also do these they do their weekly tech tanks where staff come and learn and share ideas working on various technology tools uh, and they have they they showcase uh, the amazing work of our teachers with their innovative teacher spotlight website, and they just they just they do so much more, and uh, I just wanted to showcase that and highlight them tonight. Um, they're an amazing team of highly talented educators, and we're really lucky to have them supporting our our staff. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Um, finally, under this section, we have item 8.4. This is the Communication Workers of America, representing our substitute teachers. Is anyone here tonight?
Okay, we'll move on to our action items. Item 9.1, CSEA's appointed personnel commissioner. And this again is a report by Pam Shank. Good evening, President DeSerpa, uh, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Again, I'm Pam Shanks, Director of Classified Personnel, and this is the action item where I am asking the board to approve Catherine Griffin as the CSEA point appointed personnel commissioner for the upcoming term. Are there any speakers? None. Okay, is she here tonight? She is not. She's no. not here. Okay. Yeah. Any comments or questions from the board? Bless you. Any comments from the board? Looking for a motion to approve. Make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion carries 502. Thank you, Pam. Thank and you so much. And congratulations and thank I will let her know. Ms. Griffin for her service to the great. district. That's thank great. Thank you. This is item 9.2, resolution 222317, support of Proposition 31 to prohibit the retail sale of certain flavored tobacco products. Thank you so much. So this is a resolution, as was mentioned, um, for the board to support Proposition 31. Um, what we know and through our work with PBPSA, we know that a significant amount of, amount of our youth um, begin um, as young adults with using tobacco, and that they, if they are using it as a youth, they obviously are much more likely to use it as an adult as well. And within the state of California, approximately 10% of all adults and youth still use tobacco product, products. Um, and so um, it also suggests that um, youth are more likely than adults to use what we call um, nicotine, uh, electronic nicotine delivery system or end products. Some of them call that vaping. Um, and these um, products specifically are targeting children. So when you think of these um, flavored tobacco products, they specifically are targeting them. Um, and so this would not allow the, them to use um, particular flavors that are actually shown that are, are by children. And so they would include fruit, mint, menthol, honey, chocolate, and vanilla flavors. Um, so if this was the past, then we wouldn't be able to do that. Um, they wouldn't be able to sell them. Um, and so we are working alongside PVPSA to support this effort and deter our youth from tobacco use and, of course, um, supporting this. Um, there is some um, ramifications um, financially for the state of this, um, but we believe that it would lead to better health and um, reduce health care costs. So we think in the long term it will actually wind up um, saving um, the community money and, of course, to save the health of our students. So we're recommending the approval of the resolution. Okay. Are there any speakers to this item? We do. We have one speaker, Chris Webb. Um, so generally speaking, for well, for schools, you know, bans are, are, are good, can be, you know, I'm, I'm – this is already prohibited for our students to have, um, so that's that's one thing. But for generally speaking, when it comes to broader society, I don't really go for bans. And and I guess one of my concerns is I had heard in recent weeks um, a, a district office personnel person came, spoke to us about vaping, and then they were talking about nicotine. And the thing that kind of got to me was like, well, you know, like nicotine vapes. That's not the big concern where, at my site, there's vaping is maybe a concern, less so this year than previous years, but um, it's not really nicotine that I'm, I'm super worried about, especially when students go to home to drive. Um, so I guess my concern is that we might be like, yes, we're going to support this, this ban, but then I don't really see this as like um, that helpful. I think like what would be actually more helpful to go on a politically incorrect limb would be to take that SRO money and instead use it to bring back the dogs and find them that way because actually vaping is really hard to uh, like catch because of the nature of it and the, the how it dissipates so quickly and then sometimes kids become more brazen doing things like in class and it becomes very difficult so I feel like having the dogs and this isn't like about regulating kids it's just about deterring 
in a way that would actually maybe deter more than because we've done the mental health thing we have that but i i think we're not really getting um the results that we maybe could and also like there's the whole for some people this is like a business and i don't mean like retail stores i mean um illicit business so i i think there's just better ways to approach this kind of thing thank you Okay, thanks, Chris. Do we have any questions or comments from the board about this one? Moriel, do you have any questions? So as a board, we have, I'll just have a comment. As a board, we have supported the banning of flavored tobacco already in our community, right? And I think there is, is it an ordinance or? Yes, I wonder if Lowell's still here, but yeah, as a city also, um, uh, passed an ordinance banning flavored tobacco from being sold at pharmacies. And we did that with the help of the youth group Empower Watsonville, correct? That's correct. Yeah, so we're, I, I think that was a unanimous decision then, and I'm guessing the board members that are here tonight will support this. So. Um, Jen? And I just wanted to say, you know, um, one of my other roles, I, I have hold a public health nurse, and we had almost we had, had made such inroads on eradicating teen tobacco use until the introduction of flavored teen products, particularly with vape. And we had seen almost a complete reversal of the trend, downward trend, with the introduction of flavored nicotine products. It just spiked right back up again. And with my background and seeing the health impact, the long term health of these products, it's brutal. It's like I, I, I see what happens to people. I see the house self out. I saw them all the time in the hospital. It's like I could tell you, you know, every time I, no, it's like every time I started an IV, I'm like, mm, smoker. You know, it's like I could tell. So it's, I'll be in. I think the only other thing I will add to that is just really unfortunate how youth are just being targeted. Um, and while I understand it may be business for some, I, I don't see how I cannot support moving this forward, um, given that we are in the business of protecting our youth and supporting them in any way possible. Um, so with that, I'll make a motion to approve this item tonight. I'll second. First and a second, we have, I think, Jen Chuck are away from her seat, but I think we have quorum. So first and second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries four, one, two. Sorry. <laughs> four, zero, three. Thank you. Item 9.3 is next, a resolution 22-23-23, recognizing November as Native American Heritage Month. Good evening, President Deserpa, Board Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I would like to start by acknowledging that we are on the unceded land of the Amamutsin Tribal Band. The Amamutsin are descendants of indigenous people who during the California Inquisition were converted, enslaved, or murdered and taken to Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista Mission. Today, the Amamutsin Tribal Band is working to restore traditional stewardship practices on the land and heal from historical trauma. In acknowledging the indigenous community, the elders both past and present and future generations, I am honored to present Resolution 22-23-23, recognizing November as Native American Heritage Month. In all the resolutions that I've been up here before presenting to you, this one has occupied the most in my mind and my heart. Growing up, my elders were very proud to be part of the Chumash people, but with this pride came burden and trauma. I have seen and felt the effects of generational trauma and have had many family members pass way too young. Presenting this resolution comes with a huge responsibility of balancing the historical genocide, generational trauma, with celebrating the whispers of indigenous people who are finally being heard. In our resolution, we expanded to Native North Americans to include our Mixteco, Zapotec, 
Tarahumaras, Huicholes, Huicholos, and Tarascos community to recognize the cultural diversity and celebrate the strengths of indigenous communities. With that, whereas during the month of November is Native American Heritage Month, Pajaro Valley Unified is honored to acknowledge and celebrate local and non-local indigenous North Americans and the significant contributions made to, to grow the U.S. Whereas Native North Americans are descendants of the original indigenous inhabitants of what is now known as North America. Whereas the majority of Santa Cruz County was home to the Waswas people, including the Soquel, Pahataka, Sayanta, Kalindarut, and Aptos Triblet, who are collectively part of the Mamutsen Tribal Band. And whereas there are not notable North Americans that have made and are making distinct and important contributions to California, the United States, and the rest of the world in many fields, including the fields of agriculture, medicine, music, language, art, and Native Americans have distinguished themselves as inventors, entrepreneurs, spiritual leaders, and scholars, and now environment. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District proclaims November 2022 as Native American Heritage Month and recognize the importance in the education and celebration of Native North American culture and with appropriate and accurate programs and activities to honor the rich history and culture of Native North America. Thank you. Are there any speakers? Um, yes, we have one speaker to this item, Chris Webb. Uh, normally, I just support this kind of a resolution for my seat, but after the Italian American Heritage Resolution last meeting, I found myself cringing from the crowd, and I realized I need to reread some of these materials before the meeting. So this this resolution, I don't really have any problem with, but um, because of the PBSD's great work with ethnic ethnic studies, I was really disappointed about the Italian American one um, being tainted by Columbus, and um, I'm just thankful that there was no like mention of Mussolini either or to, to make that one, that previous one, even worse. Um, I, that was a preventable error. And with the expertise we have in this district, we could have had people look over that to, to not have that kind of thing. So with that in mind, I have a couple friendly amendments for this one to add a little meat. Uh, whereas PVUSD condemns the brutal violence against Native Americans that Christopher Columbus was responsible for, PVUSD resolves to never glorify Columbus in a future resolution. Whereas PVUSD seeks to emulate the spirit of Bartolome de las Casas, who spoke out against Columbus's violence against Native Americans in history, we, the PVUSD, resolve to speak out at the city, state, federal level for a seven-mile buffer zone around schools um, with respect to pesticides. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions from the board on this resolution? Okay, Oscar. Just a quick comment. I I uh, support this resolution. Uh, my great grandmother was Apache Indian in the Chinati region of Texas. Um, in having conversations with my dad, uh, and he would tell me the stories that he would remember of her, and uh, you know they experienced a lot a lot of prejudice, a lot of prejudice in Texas. Um, and my dad telling the stories of being a truck driver, not going to, or being able to go to restaurants, but having to go to the back door to be served. So, you know, there it's it's out there, and it's unfortunate. But we have to overcome and be better than that, though. So, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Soto. Any other comments? I'd like to thank Lisa for sharing your personal story too um, as part of this resolution and I'd like to make a motion to support this resolution tonight. I'll second. Is there more comments? Okay. Trustee Holm. Yes, I think we all have an opportunity to learn from our histories, you know, our, our personal history. About how how do we learn from, from our ancestors, those who you know came to the country from other places for our ancestors who were here already. Um, how do we honor both parts of our 
acknowledge the difficult aspect of that duality. Challenge come from full acknowledgement. Duality. We all have an opportunity to reflect and not a Thanks. Christy Shocker. <laughs> thank you. Just um, I just wanted to say um, thank you for bringing this forth. And, um, you know, the part that stands out to me is PV is committed to enhancing equity, inclusion, diversity, and partnership, right, in our schools. And working with the Ethnic Studies Committee, I've been able to sit on some of their meetings, and this embodies what they're trying to make the community aware of, of the ancestors that came before it before us and how do we best honor those and how do we best teach our community about those ancestors while embracing all of our cultures here in Santa Cruz County. So I think that um, this resolution is a good step forward. I think our um, continued development of our ethnic studies courses will even enhance this resolution over the coming years. So thank you. Thank you. I, I know I have a first because I made it. Did I have a second? second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502. Thank you. Thank you. Item 9.4, Resolution 222320 for School Psychology Week, November 7th through 11th. The presentation by Heather Gorman. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees, and community members. I'm Heather Gorman, Special Services, SELPA Director. Okay. So I'm here to celebrate our school psychologist, and I have several school psychologists that are here tonight. And anybody that's going to speak tonight with me, come on up. Yeah, school psychs, come on up. And thank you so, for being here. Yes. So during the week of November 7th through 11th, 2022, schools throughout the United States will celebrate National School Psychology Week. The following resolution speaks to the work that the school psychologist does for PVUSD. I present this resolution this evening to highlight their work and dedication. One way to draw attention to the importance of school psychology services and children's mental health is to have a resolution commending the work of Pajaro Valley Unified School District School Psychologists. One of the missions of the PVUSD is to empower school psychologists by advancing practices to improve learning, behavior, and mental health for all children and youth. Tonight, I have the honor of presenting this resolution alongside of several of our school psychologists. And I want to give them a few minutes to speak to their mission and vision as PVUSD school. Good evening. Thank you so much for allowing us to take some time for this mission statement with you. Uh, so I'm Marie Stone. I'm one of the school psychologists, uh, and this is Marie West. So the, the goal of creating the mission statement was set in motion after many discussions about how to help our students in their thinking. Um, and so uh, many people uh, contributed to this mi uh, mission statement, but I want to give credit credit to you. This is Carrie West, one of the lead psychologists, and she led a group of psychologists. Uh, they met, they put the ideas down, um, and then they created this final document. I attended the last meeting and said, yay, that looks great. And so I just want everybody to know that <laughs> Perry and a few of the other psychologists who aren't here really put a lot of work into this. So we're going to jump into it so that we can have time to share it with you guys. So as PV USD school psychologists, we unify our students, families, and colleagues so we may work together to create a community that is inclusive, compassionate, and capable. We aspire to help all children reach their fullest potentials while upholding our professional ethics and integrity. 
School psychologists aim to inspire all learners to recognize their strengths, have the courage to work to overcome challenges, and the confidence to pursue their life's aspirations. As school psychologists, our vision for students is to promote whole student-focused learning, behavior, and mental health for academic, social, and emotional and behavioral success. NASP is our professional us with this vision. It is our mission to proactively support the whole student, family, community with our core values of unifying, promoting, inclusive, inclusivity, inspiring, well-being, and integrity. So first we have unifying to work collaboratively with colleagues, staff, students, families, and community including to work in consultation with district, school psychologists, and mentoring of incoming graduate school psychologists. Unificación, trabajar en colaboración con colegas, personal, estudiantes, familias, y comunidad, incluyendo para trabajar en consulta con los psicólogos escolares del distrito y la tutoría con psicólogos que vienen de la escuela de posgrado. Promoting advancement and advocacy for student-focused support, access, and utilization of resources. Inclusivity, supporting the least restrictive environment, LRE, with research-based interventions to optimize student-focused attainment and growth. It is the practice and policy of providing equal access to opportunities and resources for students who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized. Inclusividad, apoyar el ambiente menos restrictivo con intervenciones basadas en investigaciones para optimizar el rendimiento y crecimiento centrado en el estudiante. Es la práctica y póliza de proporcionar igualdad de acceso a oportunidades y recursos para los estudiantes que de otro modo podrían estar ex excluidos o marginados. Inspiring, to instill hope for each student to pursue happiness, fulfillment, and growth to achieve life goals, to appreciate their uniqueness and aspirations, to support learners reaching their highest potential. Inspiración, para inculcar que cada estudiante busque la felicidad, la plenitud, y el crecimiento para lograr objetivos de su vida, para apreciar su singularidad y aspiraciones, y para ayudar a los estudiantes a alcanzar su potencial máximo. well-being, educating students, families, and staff regarding mental, emotional, and physical well-being by utilizing healthy coping skills to ensure the safety of each student. Integrity, follow best practice, professional code of ethics, laws, handle each case with care while considering the whole student, including linguistic, cultural, and environmental factors. Integridad, seguir las mejores prácticas, el código de ética profesional y las leyes, resolver cada caso con cuidado considerando al estudiante en su totalidad, incluyendo factores lingüísticos, culturales y ambientales. Thank you so much. I hope that while listening to some of that, um, uh, you guys were able to reflect and really think about the care and consideration that goes into our work. I also would like to acknowledge that there is uh, we're a diverse group uh, there are some of us uh, 10 plus years in our profession and then there are some of us who are just starting and um, I just think that this is a wonderful group the new psychologists who are come in are basically the face of our of the future of this department and it's looking very bright so thank you very much so we would like to honor we, and we would be honored if you passed this resolution tonight to recognize and celebrate the work of the school psychologist. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Do we have any speakers to this item? We do. We have four. We have uh, Dr. Jill Talley, followed by Alondra Cruz. Hello, everyone. 
Um, I'm Dr. Jill Talley, and I'm representing Cal State Monterey Bay School Psychology Program. And I am excited um, to be here to talk about the importance of school psychologists and the partnership with PVUSD uh, in training the new psych school psychs. School psychologists support students in so many ways, ac academically, behaviorally, and in their mental health. Preparation of new school psychologists is critical as we are experiencing a nationwide shortage which impacts the work that is being done now. We are incredibly grateful for the willingness of um, Paro Valley's school psychologists to supervise our students, especially Ms. Carrie West, um, who has been partnering with our program since the beginning, its beginning in 2016. Uh, I have only been at CSUMB for just under three months, and I have already learned so much about this incredible partnership. I also do love a good metaphor, and I've recently learned um, a little bit more. I was from the landlocked state of Colorado, so I've learned a little bit about otters, our mascot. Um, and we are called, when we support each other, we're called a raft, which is just the cutest thing ever. Um, so as we have created a really strong raft with PVUSD, um, it's continued to grow, and we've been able to support 26 students students to becoming new school psychologists within your district. Um, field experience is what makes graduate students go from being a person who's just studying school psychology to being a school psychologist. And as a current practice professor, I get to watch that spark that the school psychs ignite in the graduate students as they recount all of the countless lessons that they learned. Um, so you are not only helping all of your wonderful students reach their highest potential, but you're also helping future school psychologists learn how to be part of your student's story. So thank you so much for giving me the time to speak and taking time to acknowledge National School Psychology Week next month um, and to continue work supporting school psychologists. Thank you. Thank you. After Alonda Cruz, we'll have Carrie West and then Sean Henry. Hi, I'm Alondra Cruz. I'm a first year intern, um, school psych. I'm from CSUMB. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, and like Dr. Tally mentioned, my program specializes in social justice and working with English language learners. Um, coming from a Mexican American background, I think it's really important to have this representation in this field. Um, just so students see that there's people like them in fields like social psychology that are really important. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about some of the work that I'm doing with my internship. Um, fortunate, fortunately, because of the collaboration with CCUMB and with PVUSD, my caseload is a lot smaller than um, full-time psychologists, so I'm very fortunate with that. And due to that, I get to practice things that um, I have been taught, like counseling. I'm starting a counseling group with another intern um, at Watsonville High School to support students that are struggling with those um, anxious behaviors that they have at school or outside of school. So they're going to be utilized with strategies and tools that they can use whenever they're faced with um, anxious behaviors or um, difficulties. Um, I also get to do a lot of consulting with teachers, families, and students with behavioral problems, any type of support, academic supporting. Um, but yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, board members and PVUSD community. My name is Carrie West. Thank you for the introductions, everybody. Um, uh, on the internet, I saw a quote from Helen Keller as stating, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. I am proud to say this is my 20th year as a school psychologist in the district. As part of the School Psychology Recognition, Recognition Week, this includes our retired, long-term, newly hired, interns, and practicum students for this recognition as part of the PVUSD community. We work as a network with our community, including our work collaboration with CSUMB School Psychology Graduate Program. The CUSUMB program was established seven years ago, and this will be my sixth year working with students from the program. I call it an accomplishment since the CSUMB program has been established. I have worked with 11 graduate students and with one of those students being from another program. Of the students I have worked with, three have been hired by the district, and the total graduate students from that program that are currently being hired by the district are six school psychologists. Most of the recent hires have included psychologists that have been raised locally, attended PVUSD schools, have previously worked for the district in another role, and most of the psychologists are bilingual and bicultural. 
A quote from an unknown source stated, by doing what you love, you inspire and awaken the hearts of others. Thank you for the recognition of School Psychologist Week and setting the foundation for highly qualified professionals entering the field of school psychology to work with our students in our community. Hello, my name is Sean Henry. Um, I'm probably the, this will probably scare Heather G, but I'm the elder statesman of all the elder statesmen left of the school psychologist after, uh, uh, so it's been 22 years. Um, so I'd like to have Alyssa stand up because actually she missed her opportunity to do it in bilingual and she's actually a school psychologist. Uh, so I'm hoping she um, actually, she's at, does birth through five at Duncan Holbert, which is an extremely difficult job. And it's a, it's a, it's a great asset to have somebody bilingual there. Uh, I did eight years there, so I'm hoping she breaks the record because that is by far the record at preschool. Um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity um, for all of this. Um, I want to thank the board as well to acknowledge um, the time it takes and the commitment and actually um, add school psychologists as coaches and mentors along with the teachers because it does, um, it's, it's providing a bit of a compensation, but as we talked about, um, you know, two hours minimum per intern, that's not really what we do. Um, but I'd also like to say, um, you know, we, we, we actually had five here and, and we have a couple home that are bilingual. Um, I think the same thing that we're doing with teachers, we should, uh, we should uh, to be competitive, you know, recognize the bilingual skills and what that brings to our school because we used to have like one <laughs> and we had Augustine who was basically a psychologist but he was a community liaison that helped all of us. Um, so it is great that we have so many bilingual school psychologists. It's, it's exactly what we want to have. Um, to bring them up into our district. And they uh, right now, um, they are actually part of our employment process because we had to hire three and we heard a fourth one that was on an emergency credential, but that one didn't quite work out. Um, so CSUMB is a great opportunity for us to have a, a mutually good working relationship. Um, and just as an example, Salinas Union High School District had a $12,000 bonus for psych interns. So, um, you know, it's a tremendous thing for us to to continue to work better, to basically make it so that more school psychologists will be supervisors, because it's basically, um, it's a very good working relationship for everyone involved. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Do we have any questions or comments from our board? Jen Holm. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll try and see if I can organize all the things that I'm feeling about this because I'm, I'm just so impressed and it's like, so I'll try and rein it all in. Um, but the work that you're doing is so important. Um, and it has so many impacts on so many levels. And was it Alondra? Is that, yeah. I, you know, we, we were talking about, you know, setting up like counseling sessions, you know, where people can work on anxiety behaviors and it's like, one, yes. It's like after everything our students have been through in like the past few years, you know, compounding on you know, everything that they had been dealing with you know, before you know, the past few years. And, and normalizing taking care of mental health as a health behavior. Yes, please. Right? That, that hey, you know, brain, part of our body, maybe we should take care of it like we would take care of any other part of our body. Hello. You know, that like provide structure for our students to learn, which means that they're doing better in their lives. You know, there are so many times where as a nurse, I would see patients in the hospital who had, you know, health issues because they, they struggled in school because they were dealing with mental health issues. You know, and it just it, it compounded and compounded and compounded. So the work that you're doing helps the school, helps the students, which helps them in school, which helps them in their lives, which helps them be healthy all around. So thank you. I, it's thank you. Thank you, Trustee Holm. Anybody else? Trustee Shocker. Thank you for all the hard work you do, and I think this um, resolution is wonderful because we definitely need our s school psychologists, right? And it goes to the point of what we've talked about with community schools and how important the whole child is. And this has been mentioned numerous times, but we need to create environments that are great learning environments for 
the children that we serve, right? And part of that learning environment is our school psychologists to be able to help students deal with issues like anxiety, um, learn coping skills, right? That's all a big part of growing up, and those are things that we need to be able to readily pass along to students these tools to teach um, them how to deal with the, the crises now before they um, get bigger and in, into adulthood. But, um, you know, our wellness center, thank you for those of you that also have supported the wellness center. I think this is just a precursor to the things that we can do as a district with um, going after the community school grants, providing the opportunity to have more school psychologists in our district to serve our students. So thanks for all your hard work. Yes, yes, just a comment. So I, I just want to echo what has already been said, um, but to piggyback on the bilingual piece, I think we, especially in the Latino community, I'm, I make, I'm Mexican, but uh, I know growing up, it's uh, in, in a Mexican household where uh, mental health is just something that we're just not used to taking advantage of. Um, I think is very important to really push for with that bilingual piece because um, as the majority of the students and families we're serving and normalizing I think just accessing mental health services I think is so critical in the community so I feel that having someone present who you're able to sort of associate with um, can go a long way uh, my sister, she's a psychologist, and I know she's not within the district, but um, in other agencies, there's definitely a need uh, for bilingual, you know, psychologists. I think it's just a need in the community in general. Um, so I, I just wanted to thank you for the work that you do, because it, it goes a long way. You're just not assisting um, students, you're assisting families and by default an entire community thank you um okay and so i have comments i always do if you guys watch some of the board meetings so somebody that's close in in my life is a school psychologist my first husband so i know very clearly what you all do um, and thank you for helping pinpoint um, strengths and weaknesses and learning styles for kids and helping them be more successful. Um, also, like Sean said, there's, um, there's a super specialty when it comes to the different areas that you serve. So somebody that's excellent and has a ton of experience, maybe at the high school level, um, might have to learn something new like preschool. And that's its own specialty, the zero to five. Um, I'm an LCSW, so I have a kindred um, profession to y'all and I also um, was one of the votes to support the internship program coming into our district so that we could train new psychologists but also have succession planning so that we could hire people in from the program that we thought were outstanding so I want to say thank you for mentoring um, all of the new students because I myself um, partner with CSUMB in all the settings I've ever worked in I've had intern two or three interns always working with me and it's a lot of work it's not just like they're they're doing like people think oh they're just taking some of the workload it's just it's it actually doesn't quite double your workload but it's it, it is extra work so for all of you who are taking interns and supervising I thank you very very much and this is um it's a wonderful resolution and I thank you for your work and know that this board supports you very much thank you for being there for our kids and thank you to CSUMB for being here tonight. It's a late night for you. Thank you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Morielle. I should have asked. Morielle has something to say, our student trustee. Um, hi, guys. So I just wanted to say how much I appreciate everyone being here who works in a setting that deals with psychology in schools. Um, I just wanted to say that you guys emanate such a calm presence in the room, and I felt that every time one of you came up to speak. And I just really wanted to say that as someone who is looking into potentially studying psychology later on, um, I know how extensive and how relevant that, that study and that field is to us. And 
it really is what makes us whole and human and I really want to emphasize how important it is to have it available at each school site. Um, thankfully, I've gotten the chance to actually have one at ours at Watsonville High School and it's the Wellness Center and I met one of the socio-emotional counselors or more specifically a mental health clinician who is now at the Family Engagement and Wellness Center and that has been such a helpful part of my growth throughout high school and having it at each school site would be really beneficial to all our students. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of rambling but I love how we also have other existing local services that deals with breaking the mental health stigma that we have um, and it's so important that it gets recognized and I'm definitely going to make an effort to uphold this week. Um, so with that being said, I, I really support this resolution <laughs> and we, we thank you so much. That's great, Morielle. Thank you. Okay, did, do we have a first and second yet? I'll make a motion to approve this item. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Five zero two. Thank you. And if you guys could come to every meeting and be a calming influence, <laughs> I'd really appreciate that. I know that I'm not always a calming influence. So <laughs> today I was on good behavior. I haven't seen you for a while, Sean. I know, I know. <laughs> all right. No, we appreciate all your input. Okay. Item 9.5, approval of initial fencing proposals. Who's doing this one? Erlindo. Hi, Erlindo Fernandez. Hi. Good evening, President Serpa, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees, Cabinet. My name is Erlindo Fernandez. I'm the Director of Maintenance and Facilities Department. And I'm here to ask for the approval of the initial fencing proposals. Back in September 28th, the board, uh, back in the September 28th board meeting, the Board of Trustees approved the use of Measure L fundings to provide additional fencing to our sites. One of the proposals I have in front of me is McQuitty School. We're adding fencing, we're adding fencing in the backside of McQuitty School and on the entry backside for the parking lot. And that also came in at $43,932. For the, for the next proposal, we have Radcliffe School. At this side, we're not doing new fencing, we're doing just slats on Westlake and Rodriguez Street. That fencing is pretty high there on that s street and it's pretty noisy because it, it's in traffic and a lot of pedestrians go by there and they want to talk to the kids, so it's very important that we get this fencing, uh, these lats in there to kind of protect the noise and the people from interacting with the kids. We're also doing a little bit of slats at, there you go back, right in the courtyard, as you can see right there by the basketball court. Um, the neighbors there, I, I think they're intertwined with the kids too, so we're going to put some slats there too. And that proposal came in at 27,720. And for our last site here, we are doing Real Dermar School. And the back side, the whole back hillside is getting fencing with one access gate in the back. Along the side, bottom side, we're getting fencing. There's already gates along by the parking lot where the cars park. And then we're also adding an additional gate at the entrance of the parking lot. At this time, that additional gate is up in the air till we determine the underground utilities there. And the, the slope on that hill too, it's, it's gonna be a little tricky to put a gate there, but we are initially trying to put a gate there. If that's not a possibility, we're gonna come from the adjacent building and put walking gates to close off the site right in that 
area where, right, right, right where you see the entrance of that parking lot. So the site will be closed off from pedestrians coming in. At this time, we're not doing nothing in the front of the school. We're, move, we're going ahead and getting proposals for ornamental fencing for the fronts of the schools. So that's a little bit more expensive. So that'll come in later, later months or later. Thank you. And just to note, this is just the first set, um, so we will be bringing forward additional schools later on, but this is the first set that we're bringing. As noted, um, we are needing to bring back the proposals for each individual school. So we noted originally in the first item, we noted many more schools than just these three schools, um, but this is the first set um, because we're trying to expedite the ones that we can expedite quickly. There's no speakers to this item. Okay, uh, do you, any questions or comments on G Trustee Holm? Um, what are the timelines for these projects? McQuitty School is as soon as we get the contract going up for the contractor, so that I would anticipate in the next month or so to get McQuitty going. Real Demar, I think by the end of December, will be complete, and Ratcliffe sh should be by then too, by, by December. Thank you. And can you tell me, like, why are we putting a fence on Rio Del Mar in the back there? Like, what's the need? <laughs> Suddenly we, we have a fence. We get a lot of runners at that site, kids that take uh -huh. off and run up to the hillside. Teachers have to chase them. Not only that, I think wildlife, wildlife coming in to the site. Okay, so there's a new program at that school that has kids that, yeah, can run. I got it. And I do know there is wildlife, um, and I. But I know I do know also that kids take a trail there to go um, home to their homes. There's like a neighborhood trail, so they'll be able to still get through there. There'll be a gate there. Yes, there'll be a gate That's that with I a panic bar on it uh -huh. on that top side where the trail's at. So initially, nobody could come into the site unless you have a key, or it's going to be a push push panic bar on the to exit. So anybody from the school could exit, but you would have to have a key if you're on that side to come in. Okay, because I know the, that the program that's at the church called Magic Apple, the teachers typically walk over and get the kindergartners and walk, and walk back. That way. Yeah, and they come through that little trail. So we'll have to work that out. Okay, are there any other questions? Looking for a motion? I'll move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502. Thank you. Thank you. Item 9.6, a memorandum of understanding between PVFT and PVUSD for subbing on prep rate for secondary schools with traditional uh, one through six period schedules. Yes, thank you, President DeServer, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. The MOU in front of you tonight is to help clarify some language. Oftentimes when negotiating in a contract, you're, there's, there's the language that's written on the page and then there's sometimes the intentionality behind it. Um, oftentimes when we're trying to write language for elementary, middle, high school, um, sometimes some things can get missed. And so considering that we are having a higher than usual um, amount of teachers having to sub on their prep, um, this was an important piece of the contract to clarify. And so that's what the MOU is. So specifically, the contract talks about if, like, if classrooms are getting broken up and um, the students are being divided and going into different teacher classrooms, this is predominantly in, in elementary, then teachers are paid an hourly rate in order to do so. That same language is in there for prep, for prep periods in secondary, and then it specifically talks about block periods being paid for two hours. So what we're trying to clarify is that for schools that are on a traditional schedule, meaning they, they're one through six period and they're not block, that it's not that we're gonna pay them an hourly rate, so like if a block period was only 45 minutes, they'd get paid 45 minutes. We're gonna honor the language that's similar to the block period, where regardless of the length of the block period, it's two hours. And so clarifying that if they're covering a prep period, that's a, a single period, regardless of the time it is, they'll be paid the hour. And so that's what the MOU is trying to clarify, because the language is a little nebulous in the contract. Are there any speakers? Um, yes, we have two speakers. 
Brandon, Denise, and Roddy. Um, Brandon, Denise, um, PBFT, um, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the PVFT leadership for fighting for this MOU. Um, the reality is, is this kind of should be a give me and we shouldn't have sites where administrators um, are trying to pay 53 minutes versus the hour when the impact of losing our prep period is just huge. Um, it shouldn't be on the teachers to make up for the failings to fill those vacancies um, because we're already stretched extremely thin. Um, this MOU is a step in the right direction, but when I learned that students at my site who are suffering from these vacancies are going to start using an online learning program called APEX, um, it kind of causes me to stop and ask myself a question if are we just giving up on filling those vacancies and we're going to pay the teachers a little bit more and now we have this APEX so everything is going to be good. Um, at least when we sub for our on our prep during these classes at Lakeview, our students will have some type of content because right now it's it's tough out there. Um, but Apex, Ingenuity, and any type of online for-profit platform cannot replace the work that teachers do. Um, so thank you for agreeing to this MOU because your teachers desperately need to be compensated for the work we do. Um, we're not going to give up on our students, so please don't give up on trying to find um, substitutes and qualified teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Trust, uh, President DeSerpa and Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. Um, I also want to thank the district for um, hearing us when we brought this concern forward to them. Um, the reason we we are presenting this MOU to you tonight is, um, Brandon Dennis just spoke to it, is that we had sites who were adding insult to injury, basically, when teachers are being pulled from their in extremely in important prep time, um, getting docked nine minutes of that time in pay. Um, so it, I'm, I'm thankful that the district was very speedy in coming to this resolution and bringing this forward to the board so we can get that resolved, as well as retroing it this back to when we agreed to increase that sub pay. And while we did that only for secondary sites, we do know the impact is felt everywhere because as those subs are all pulled up to secondary, anytime there is an absence in elementary, there is not a sub to cover, right? Um, I just want to point out a couple of other things. Um, we are still facing these vacancies, which is why we keep stepping forward with these MOUs, right? And in looking at the 21, 22 unaudited actuals, the district had an ending reserve balance of $59.7 million. Why are we going into this school year with this number of vacancies? including our CSEA brothers and sisters. If you take that 3% by law we are required, that's 8.4 million. And then I know the Board of Trustees voted to keep an additional 6.8 million. That's 15.2 million. That still leaves $44.5 million that could have been put towards salaries for this school year. Just want you to have that in your heads. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from our board? Yes. Okay, Christy Shocker. So thank you for speedy resolution for this MOU. Um, my question is, with our other MOUs, um, are there more MOUs in the work regarding prep time? Not currently, no. Okay, so we're, we haven't moved forward about a previous request for Wednesday prep time for one Wednesday a month for teachers? Oh, I'm sorry. We didn't do that in an MOU. We had a conversation about mitigating it in a way to, again, put it where the problem is, mm -hmm. um, which is, so what we're doing is monthly, we're going to look at the number of absences that went uncovered, and we can do that in our subsystem. So then what will happen, like we're going to look at October, and so if, if sites meet a certain threshold of uncovered vacancies, they will get a, a Wednesday off. So this month we did it at 
school. Now you're going to ask me to remember. I believe it's PV High, Watsonville High, Rolling Hills, and Soldo, and Lakeview. Maybe EA Hall too. But we did that from September, kind of the beginning of the year for October. So they should have received an extra Wednesday off for this month. And then we're going to do that same practice moving forward for each month so that we can put the, solve the problem where the problem is and the, where the impact is. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you're trying to solve the problem. I still think that our teachers at all sites would benefit from a guaranteed Wednesday of prep time since that was our initial goal when we gave early release on Wednesdays is to have teachers do prep. Thank you for working on that. Are there any other comments from the board? Okay, I'll make a motion to support this. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries, 502, thank you. Item 9.7, classroom and support supplies for certificated staff. Hi, Rich. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm pleased to present and request your proposal or your approval for um, this proposed initiative to continue the PO per teacher into the um, into January and the spring. Uh, the board previously approved $125 purchase orders with Palace Business Solutions for all eligible certificated staff members. Staff have had access to those purchase orders since September. Those ones are set to expire on December 1st um, with your approval tonight. Uh, eligible staff would have an additional $125 to spend when they return from winter break and those would expire um, March 31st. And then I do want to be clear that um, we are holding the expiration date of the current POs to try to encourage the spending. So it will not be a $125 on top of whatever balance is left as of December 1st. It would be refreshing it and there'd be an additional 125 uh, to start fresh with in January. Um, the initiative is ESSER 3 funded, so it's not impacting any site budgets. And yeah, that's what I have. I can answer any questions about. Yeah. Okay, are there any comments? Any speakers, actually? Um, yes, Nelly. <laughs> Good evening. Um, so thank you for having um, asked to have this brought back for the spring. Um, and <clears throat> what I want to speak to is you know, we just, and this is what we spoke, what I spoke to last time, it, there's an exclusion list. You just commemorated the wonderful work that school psychologists do, and yet they are excluded from this $125. My sister is a school psychologist, and I know that she buys things to take to work with her students in her um, sessions. Um, this excludes speech language therapists. They, too, use... Uh, manipulatives in their in their um, programs working with students same with our um, nurses and, t and other TOSAs they could all use the aid of some manipulatives in their work and so it is unfortunate that there is an exclusion list because we all spend money on materials um, and then another item here I noticed that anybody who is hired after November 1st is not eligible, and my question is why? Because this is for the spring, so this is for um, a $125 um, amount that would be basically next semester. So if somebody comes to work in this district next month, aren't they a dedicated PBFT, PBUSD employee? Um, so why would they be excluded from this? Um, that's all I have to say. Um, thank you. This is helpful. It's especially helpful if the administrators know that they cannot micromanage <laughs> the, you know, what our what, um, our teachers are deeming to be um, reasonable and and uh, useful in their in their teaching practice to purchase from with this hundred and twenty five dollars, but also. You know, our school psychologists, speech language therapists, program specialists, nurses, TOSAs, um, they, they're deserving of this too. Thank you. Thank you. Is that the only speaker? 
Yes. Okay, any questions or comments from the board? Trustee Shocker. So I think um, Trustee Orozco and, and I both asked this last time, um, Dr. Rodriguez, and the reason we had um, think excluded school psychologists speech and language um, was you said that the SELPA had a stipend for them that they were able to use, is that correct? Okay, so that is still there. They have a stipend that they should be able to access and if they're having problems, they should let you know. Exactly. Okay, um, thank you for clearing that up. And then my other question is, yes, I noticed that too and I was gonna ask that about why are we ending it on November 1st instead of December 31st? For the um, staff hired, um, it says um, certificated staff hired on or after November first are not eligible for this initiative for the 22-23 school year. So I was just wondering why we didn't extend it to the end of the school year, since we're trying to hire. Well, I think there can be conversations about that November first date. We, I will note that. Th these purchase orders are going to expire March 31st um, and they're going to begin on January 17th. Um, we do have to have them in the system, so, but I'm, I'm fine unless there's an issue, I'm fine with stating um, January, January 15th or something like that if they're purchased, if they're um, if they're hired prior to January 15th. After January 15th, I feel like, um, you know, it probably will be only a few people, but um, I feel like we have to have a stop date sometime. Um, but I, I think we're fine with placing that um, to be January 15th. I don't have a problem with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Go ahead. So I'm also in support of pushing that date. Um, and, and I would uh, love to see the board consider increasing, slightly increasing that stipend uh, in the future. <laughs> I, I, I know, I understand that, but you know, it's um, just with inflation and you know, uh, everything just costs more. So whatever we can do in the future for the new board to decide, <laughs> um, I, would, I would push for that. Thank you. And, and with that, I would like oh. to make a motion to approve this item. Okay, I'll second, but I have more discussion. I don't understand why we have to break this into two POs. Like why does we have to have a first PO and it has to be spent by a certain date, which is December, and then a second one the second year? Like why can't they just? So as we stated the first time, the reason why we didn't extend the amount the first time was twofold. One, we needed to find a budget for it, and so we are using one-time monies um, for that. And then two, these have already been created in alignment with Palace. And so they're already within the system. So prior to um, bringing it, it was already because it's something that we've been doing in the past and we haven't changed the amount in the past. Um, that $125 was already in the system. So this is the second set. Um, it also will help us with being able to identify if and when staff are using the additional funding. Um, and so because of that, um, we are doing it as two separate things. Okay, it just everything is so expensive and if there's like a big ticket item like a bookshelf or I don't know what that a teacher might wanna buy, just it would be great to just have it all in one PO instead of two and it's less work for everybody so that's why, anyway. Well I think in the future if, if we are deciding that we want to have a specific amount and we, um, in the past, we for the past three years, we've done the 125, and so that is what was budgeted. And so in the future, if we're choosing to do the $250, then we can do that as one lump sum this next year. Um, but we will need to find the funding source, um, which we could probably use one-time monies for. Yeah, okay. So I we just have one other uh -huh, question. Go ahead. So do we still have, like, a pretty good percentage of teachers not taking advantage of this? 
or for the most part? Um, I can speak to that. So yeah, I've, I've kept really good track of uh, the previous two versions of this. Um, we landed between, I think, 75 and 80% of the funding being spent. So that, okay. I think, both times we were right around 135 to 140 thousand dollars that was budgeted for this initiative, and right around 100 thousand got spent both times. I can say right now we've um, been invoiced for 25 thousand dollars worth of product as part of this. So if you divide that by 125, that's only about 200 teachers taking advantage of this right now. Um, so yeah, so we're always looking for different ways to help this and make, yeah. make sure that, that we are Absolutely. using it. Um, one of the ways that we did that last year was we got to that 80% mark a lot quicker by setting the expiration date a lot sooner. So that's, mm -hmm. I, I know there's a balance of giving everybody enough to, to get what they want, but there's also an advantage to having everybody take advantage of at least a little bit of it. And we haven't seen, you know, it cross that 80% mark yet. Uh, I have a question. In, in past years, when I was like a parent on volunteering on campus, like the school district didn't have enough money, even just like for construction paper and like you name it, like basic, basic things. And so parents were asked to buy a lot of that. And you'd go into the supply room, and there just wasn't even any, almost anything on the shelves. Has that all been rectified? Like, are are our schools fully stocked with all the supplies that they need? Um, I mean, I can't speak to every single site. They all have supply purchase orders in place to order the core items that they that they need and um, looking at what we close out at the end of the year nobody's really zeroed out when we look at closing out mm -hmm. in, um, in the spring so um, I know there's always extra things that are needed to do more projects you know bigger and better things but um, core supplies our sites are doing a great job staying stocked okay um, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, Morielle. Hi there. Um, and so while I was listening to you guys speak and discuss, I did want to mention that I think a large part of getting that budget spent for the teachers is to take into account student input and just asking, like simply asking the students what they might need in their classroom because I had that experience last year with another budget but it had to do with um, like classroom materials as well. And it was really helpful in that we got to reflect on everything that we had and still needed. And um, I think just asking, like simply asking the students would be really helpful. And also just making sure that they know that we have money to spend also is really important. Um, and with that, I did also want to extend a thank you to Trustee Daniel Dodge, even though he couldn't be here today. Um, he got, or he was able to um, respond and act on a need or proposal for cooling systems due to a lack of AC in the upper classrooms in the Mellow Building. Um, and that was in light of like extreme heat and it's been an ongoing problem at our site and I just wanted to extend that thank you. He was able to uh, send over fans that were really nice and they're really good quality. <laughs> um, and I think Oh, okay. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I think that's just an example of how this money could be could be spent. And it, it's really helpful to students in our everyday learning. So thank you so much. Okay. Anyone else? First and second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Motion carries 502. Item 9.8, adoption of resolution 22-23-22, request for CalSTRS separation from service requirement exemption. Hi, Good Brian. evening, hi. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. I come to you tonight with a resolution to request for um, a separation for an uh, incoming teacher. Um, this teacher retired and wants to come back to work for us uh, within the 180-day calendar day, 180 day separation that's required from STRS. So as, as we did last time, this resolution allows this teacher to return early and begin work in a classroom without waiting the 180 days. So I respectfully request that you would uh, pass this resolution. Thank you. Are there any um, speakers? No speakers to this item. Okay, any questions or comments from the board? It's an experienced teacher. 
Yes, he taught for us for quite a while. He's returning to the school that he retired from, Tony Navarro. Um, mm -hmm. So he taught special ed for us. So he's re actually returning to the, pretty much the same classroom. That's great. So, uh, yeah. Okay. And then, as we stated last time, this exemption is only for him. It doesn't include anyone else. I'll move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502. Thank you. Thank you. Item 9.9, .9, a new class description for Assistant Director of Maintenance and Operations. A report by Pam Shanks. Good evening, President DeSerpa, board members, and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Pam Shanks, Director of Classified Human Resources. Um, the following item you have before you is a new class description, um, Assistant Director of Maintenance and Operations. Uh, two classified management positions have recently become vacant in the Maintenance and Operations Department, which gave the uh, administration the opportunity to review their, their needs. Um, they did request to add the position of this assistant director, um, which will replace two classified management positions, one of which is the Senior Project Manager Facility Bonds Program and one of our vacant supervisors of maintenance and operations. Um, this will allow for better alignment of work and it will also result in a cost savings to the district. Um, we are also working on adding a classified um, position called Senior Planning Specialist, but we are still in process with working with CSEA on that job description. It'll be a bargaining unit position. Um, the Personnel Commission did approve this job description and salary placement at their October meeting, and so I respectfully ask the board to approve the new class description and the revised classified management salary schedule as presented. Are there any speakers? None. Okay, any comments or questions from the board on this one? Okay, I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502, thank you. Thank you. Next is item 9.10, a new class description for payroll and benefits specialist. Good evening again, President DeSerpa, board members, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, th this item is a new class description, payroll and benefits specialist. Um, when positions become vacant, it is a good time to review needs of a department, and if needed, make changes to align the work. Um, this allows the HR office also to recruit accurately for positions. Um, currently, the benefits office had two full-time positions. One was a benefits analyst and a benefits specialist. So there were two full-time uh, positions. Recently, the benefits specialist became vacant when that incumbent promoted into the higher level position, into the analyst position. Um, so upon reviewing the work and needs of her department, the manager determined she didn't need two full-time benefits employees, but would need the equivalent of one and a half. So when she, we were looking at other districts and out in the market, um, we found crossover in the work of benefits and payroll, and that other organizations have positions that cover both bodies of work. So the job description presented tonight encompasses both payroll and benefits work. Um, this position will be a full-time position at 40 hours per week. Um, and it will cover about 50% benefits and 50% payroll work. Um, the, position, the Personnel Commission did approve the job description and salary placement um, at their October meeting. And so again, I respectfully ask the board to approve the, salary, or the job description as presented and the revised classified salary schedule as presented. Are there any speakers? None. Okay, any questions from the board? I make a motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Item 9.11 a safe return to in person instruction and continuity of service plan. Yeah, thank you very much. So, as we have noted previously, every six months we must update our safe return to school plan. Um, we must do this in order to um, continue to utilize our ESSER money. So we won't receive the ESSER money and we also cannot use it without that. Um, and so we were, this is an update and as it has, we've done in the past, this is an update according to CDPH requirements. So you actually, there are five different areas in which there are updates. Um, you'll see that employee screening has been removed um, because we are no longer requiring um, the daily screening. Um, we also, as was noted, um, Previously, um, we have now we now allow visitors and volunteers um, to not be vaccinated. So, 
as the state changed that requirement, we too changed that requirement, and so we removed the requirement to be vaccinated. Um, there was a separate section that talks to the daily screening. We removed that. Um, we also removed the portion um, that unvaccinated employees were required to test because now they are no longer required to test per um, the state of California. And the last portion is um, we updated our numbers on social emotional supports because they had increased um, since the last six months. And so requesting that you approve this plan um, I did provide it um, for feedback from PBFT and CSEA. Um, Nellie did find one error, um, and so we corrected that, which was um, the definition of close contact was um, is now updated um, because it's now anyone that is with um, in an indoor building with you, um, and it no longer is just the six feet, but um, rather about indoor building. Um, and so I appreciate the approval of the board. Are there any speakers to this one? None. Okay, any questions or comments from the board? Make a motion to approve. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502, thank you. And thanks for all the work that went into that. Um, item 10.1, TK through 12, 12 student social emotional learning outcomes and MTSS update. The report prepared by um, our assistant superintendent of secondary and our assistant superintendent of elementary education, Ms. Lisa Aguirre and Mr. Casey Clappenbach. Good evening, President DeSerpa, board trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I, Mr. Clappenbach and I are back this evening for the part three in a three part series. Um, and so tonight we will, we will be looking at our district wide data and MTSS through social emotional learning. Okay, we're good. Um, so the um, purpose of the, the study session is to look at the different, first we did academics, then we did behavioral, and now we're looking at social emotional learning. Throughout our system, the data that we had collected for last year, the 21-22 school year, and some of the different tiers and interventions that we have in place for students. All right, so now you get to watch the video that we missed last time, which is Radcliffe Elementary Student and it's based off the behavioral piece of it, but we know that behavior also supports social, emo social emotional learning also. So without further ado. All right, just follow along. Follow along. <laughs> All right. You ready? Yes. Three, Three, two, two one. one. Respectful, I can do my best. I'm a red dragon and I'm on a quest to, to be, be the best, best that I can be. be. Let me hear you say it, you and me. Respectful, accountable, do my best. I'm a red dragon and I'm on a quest to be the best that I can be. Let me hear you say it, you and me. It's R A D Red. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Uh, all right, so I know that you are all ready to be rad dragons right now, right? So that was really working on the piece of PBIS and making students proud, right? And know the high expectations of all students and then feeling like they belong and part of something greater. So tonight, just like Lisa was talking to you about, this is our third session, and tonight we will focus on social emotional learning aspects. We'll hit on Sown to Grow. Also, the volume of supports and services provided by our social emotional counselors, counselors and mental, mental health clinicians, and also the supports and resources that have been provided through our wellness center. And so now you get to enter two separate classrooms also. You, we will start with at the beginning of the year at a kindergarten classroom with a community building circle at a Mesty Elementary School. Oh. 
Is that it? Can you put still? A dog. Can you say my favorite animal? My favorite animal is, is a dog. Awesome. My favorite animal is a panda. My favorite animal is an elephant. Awesome. Favorite animal? Um, favorite animal? Favorite animal? Favorite All right. So as you can see. Our kindergartners, that's the start of a community building circle, which is based off of restorative practices. It's making sure that all of our students have that voice and they're learning how to take turns and listening to one another. And our next video is going to show us the opposite extreme down the continuum in secondary. It'll be an ethnic studies class um, at PVHS. And they will be talking about the differences in their proactive um, community building circle, about the difference between um, empathy and compassion. <laughs> All right, so hopefully you can see that identity, belonging, and agency is continuing right through our, our restorative um, community building circles, and then it will help us when we actually get to the repair of harm, which um, where students are trying to actually forgive one another and be able to empathize w when those situations are not, when it's more responsive as opposed to that proactive piece. All right, so um, again, we're gonna hit on all three of these areas. And the first one we're going to hit on is our Sone to Grow, our social emotional um, monitoring platform where students are able to identify how they're feeling throughout the week and teachers are able to respond and support them through um, giving them feedback and being able to read their reflections. And so if you pay attention to some of the largest numbers, we had over 73,000 student reflections last year. And so that's incorporating um, the summer before school started also as we piloted the program. And then we also had 28, over 28,000 teacher feedback responses in support of our students. As we look through the year on the graph to your right, you will notice the green, the um, the darker green is very happy. It indicates that our students are very happy. The lighter green indicates that they're happy. And the white indicates okay. And the two colors at the bottom are sad and very sad. All right. And so what you, I do want to um, point your attention to is as the school year moved on, our students it, their happiness increased and we were able to monitor that and then respond to it at those at those more challenging times so I know that we started the year off at 65% of our students if you combine the two areas of green we're happy at the happier areas and by the end we had 78% of our students um, either happy or very happy as indicators as we're moving on to this year's um, data which is very fresh it was just pulled you will notice that we had 
an increase already of our students that were giving their reflections. All right, so the students already an increase of 4,000, and then we also had an a uh, 9,000 increase of, stu of teachers giving feedback already at this moment in time. All right, and then if you look on the indicator on the left, we have a consistent um, place of happiness at 3.8, right, um, with the data that we're collecting with our students. So our students at this, at this point are in that blue zone, that happy zone. And I'll hand it off to Lisa. So this graph here represents um, the, the for, this is from our social emotional counselors. And over the past year, um, when social emotional counselors meet with students, they put into a database, um, into Synergy, the type of, of interaction that they had with the student. This graph is for our elementary students and the type of um, interaction they had, the services that they provided to the student when they met with them. As you can see, the majority of the time meeting with the student was that brown area, which is just social emotional. So on that day, the student may have been off or a little sad, so the, the social emotional counselor met with them. There are different reasons um, that they can put within synergy of why that they met with the student, um, and that is indicated on the bottom. If we go to um, middle school, you see similar things. The majority is uh, the social emotional. You do have an increase in the a student in distress. And so that increases. And then if we go to the high school, we look that the students in distress um, for ninth grade female and then the 10th grade female um, were the largest out of all of the grade levels. And so um, the, the one thing that you can notice too is that the um, difference in the services that the social emotional counselor sees, so the, the student reaching out for help between um, males and females. Um, and then also our non-binary students. So with the majority also in high school is with just the, um, like the social-emotional kind of tier one um, activities and not ongoing. Um, then the next slide, what we are looking at here, these are um, services from our mental health clinician. How this is broken down is the number of students um, seen at each school site or at the wellness center. And so our mental health clinician is a tier three service. So, the, so this is where students are in crisis or are really needing um, continued support. One of the things that you do notice is that Watsonville High and Aptos High has a large portion. They also had two mental health clinicians on their school site, while PVHS last year had one mental health clinician, and that was the same for uh, Renaissance and the Wellness Center. NowPow is a newer service that we have. Um, it's a newer database that we have within our district. And what NowPow is, is it's a way that we can collect information and also um, it is a referral service for families. So last year, social emotional counselors used, were the ones that used the NowPow. It is different for this year, but last year as we are piloting it. So social emotional counselors, they're meeting with students and um, and they, they figure out what support services are needed for students. And or they bring it to the wellness team. The wellness team says, okay, we need something different. So these referrals are for, to outside agencies. In this case last year, it was mostly PVPSA and Salud para la Gente. So what takes place is that Salud para la Gente and um, PVPSA are within the NowPow system. So a referral goes in, there's somebody from Salud para la Gente who will get the referral, who can read it, can figure out, and then assign someone who will then reach out to the family. Within NowPow, it then alerts and lets us know that somebody from Salud para la Gente received the referral and is going to reach out to the family, then it tells us when the family, when they did reach out to the family and if services were provided. So it's a way to close the loop, because sometimes um, what would take place is if we referred them to an outside agency, then we would know that they were referred, but we didn't know exactly what would happen and if the loop was closed and families, families were serviced. So this is a way that we're working with our outside prov um, providers to make sure that the, um, we close the loop and that we know that services were provided. Um, for the families, and they're not just out there waiting. And then the last thing that I wanted to um, 
show this evening was the Wellness Center Transformation Community Resources. So last year in our Family Wellness and Engagement Center, this is um, by the type of service when the families came in. This excludes the Saturday um, food distribution, so this does not include that data, which would then, um, with the food, it would, it would make it a lot larger. So um, the majority of it was the food co-op visit for families coming in, and then um, followed by the Martha's Kitchen frozen um, meals. The Olin Circles is a, something that is provided um, for its small group services for students in terms of counseling. Um, and that is through the um, Luna Isol. Um, and so then that is one of the services of the hair. Then the Luna Isol on top, um, it's a tutoring services for students. So here are some of the supports as part of our action plan. And um, as you can see, it's quite extensive, so I'm just gonna highlight a few of them. The one at the top, the Sewn to Grow, it's expanded this year to second grade students are also able to utilize that in their classrooms also. And then we are also continuing professional development and modules in the, the aspect of mini lessons and social emotional um, learning for teachers to utilize with their students as needed. Um, and then as we look at the expansion of our restorative practices and our culturally, um, our culturally responsive and linguistically um, sound instruction and support. And then also we have our Sabres pilot with our K2 at a few of our schools, which is the universal screener for social emotional um, learning and needs. And then, of course, we're continuing our skills streaming, our social skills groups. So our social emotional counselors or other staff can actually look at, see what, uh, what um, issues they're having with certain students and provide that, those social skills instruction for them at another time. And then also um, expanding those services at the wellness center, including um, additional parent workshops and supports also. And then as we're looking at that tiered support, um, like we were discussing at all the other sessions, um, we start with that tier one where we want all of our students to see it, right, to receive it. So we have our PBIS implementation with the different um, supports. We're, we're making available the social emotional supports with Sewn to Grow and that access for students to have lots and lots of opportunities for their voices to be heard. From the community building circles to the co-generative focus groups that students are having their input and feedback listened to and then also providing additional access to those enrichment activities, athletics, clubs, after school, before school, during school, lunches. And then as we're moving on, what some students need, right? So we're looking at check-in and check-out, which is one of our um, highly utilized strategies for Tier 2, where students are paired up with another um, staff member or mentor on campus, and they check in with them when they arrive at school, and they have goals that they're working on. And the student, it's really helping them reflect on their day um, throughout the day, they're able to get points and, and, and work towards something. And they check in with that adult throughout the day based on their needs. And then they end the day checking out with that mentor also and have that support system connected to um, their family also. Um, and then as we're moving on, some students, like we talked about, need those social skills groups and restorative practices along with our social emotional counseling supports. And then lastly, the students, for very few of them, get to that area where they need more specialized evidence-based interventions such as mental health clinicians or intensive supports. Sometimes um, we also utilize our PVPSA Valor team, right, to Valor team to come in and also support our families and students there as well. So um, now it is time for questions and discussion. Thank you. Are there any speakers? No speakers. Okay, any questions from the board? Okay, that was great. great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you. You know, I don't want to like, like, you know.
Yeah, it's nice to see all the work that went into it. Okay, moving on to our consent agenda. Um, do we have anything that we would like to pull? I think I've already thanked all the donors for the generous money raised for the Lagasse Kitchen, so we don't need to pull those off. I'll make a motion to approve our consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries four zero three. <laughs> Okay, and I think we're on item 14.1, action and report on closed session. Okay, so under item, closed session item 2.1, I move to approve. Hmm. Yes, I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for a full expulsion for the remainder of the school year for student number 2223002. Second. Expulsion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502. Thank you. Under item 2.2. I move to approve the certificate of personnel report as presented by the district administration on October 26, 2022, with 10 and six additional action items. Second. Did we already vote on that? No. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502. Under closed session item 2.3, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district administration on October 26, 2022 with eight and six additional action items. Second. Second. Oh. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502. All right, and we have a couple announcements. Announcement number one, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce a selection of Destiny Oaks as a new academic coordinator for McQuitty Elementary, Destiny has been serving students since 2017 as a teacher, coach, and PBIS facilitator. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree and a Master's from the University of Phoenix and is in the process of completing her doctorate. She also holds a multiple subject cre teaching credential. We are excited to welcome this highly qualified educator to her new role. Go Mustangs. Announcement number two. The Powell Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Marisa Lynn Samuel as a new Watsonville High School Assistant Principal. Mrs. Samuel has been serving students since 2008 as a teacher and assistant principal at both high school and middle school. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree from CSU Fullerton in American Studies, a single subject credential in social science, and also has earned a Master's in Education Administration from Concordia University. We're excited to welcome this highly qualified educator to her new role. Go Wildcats. And announcement number three, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Ursula Dolores Vajina as the new assistant principal of Pajaro Valley High School. Mrs. Vajina started working with students in 2014 with the Tulare County Office of Education Behavioral Health Services Department. She has also been with the Monterey Peninsula Unified School District dual language academy since 2016 as a family services specialist she holds a bachelor's of science degree in biology from ucsc and a master's of science in educational counseling from national university she also holds a pupil personnel services credential mrs vahina is currently enrolled in a doctorate program with an emphasis in leadership and education we're excited to welcome this highly qualified educator to her new role go grizzlies and that's all we have for a closed session. Okay. Thank you. Our uh, next meeting of the Board of Trustees will meet on November 16th at seven o'clock here in the boardroom. Thank you, our meeting is now adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>